Okay, good morning. It is Thursday, October 5th. Pretty amazing how the months just keep flying by. But it's October 5th, and as always, why don't we take a moment, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, Mike. Okay, let's uh, start with some priority. Carol, and let's start from my left. Uh, Commissioner Vigliotti, what's on your mind? Well, first of all, Commissioner Rossi, it's very nice to have you back, and I'm glad that you're uh, with us in person. Me too. Thanks. So uh, over the weekend, I had a phenomenal time at Tawny Towns Harvest Festival on Saturday. It's always awesome to see people I know to make new friends. And among those who were set up at Harvest Fest on Saturday was the water resource team from Carroll County, uh, which includes Bureau Chief Janet O'Meara and Claire Hurt. And I always like to highlight and give credit where it's due. Um, we have so many employees who get out into the community and who do so many awesome things, educating people and helping to inform our, our citizens. And, uh, you know, when they do something like this, they certainly deserve the credit for doing so. Uh, so in this circumstance, it's uh, uh, educating uh, members of the public about the importance of protecting our waterways and our water features and how I mean, it's important because it affects everything from the water we drink to the water that sustains farmland to the water that ultimately ends up in the Chesapeake Bay. And so Janet and Claire deserve a tremendous amount of credit for dealing with a ton of yellow jackets and dealing with the impressive heat that day. And uh, the uh, presentation that they have set up uh, certainly attracted quite a number of uh, citizens. Now, elsewhere in District 1 coming up on October 6th, the Union Bridge Lions Club will be holding their Polish Pottery Bingo at the New Windsor Fire Hall. Uh, New Windsor's annual music on the main event will return this Saturday, October 7th from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. There are going to be all kinds of activities and fun things to do, including face painting for kids and a bounce house. Uh, there are also going to be all kinds of craft and food vendors as well as that. Uh, lastly, Tawny Town's Flea Market will be held on Saturday, October 7th from 9 o'clock a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. at Memorial Park. And just uh, one last quick note, we've, uh, we've been receiving a lot of emails lately, more so than normal, uh, in particular about uh, definitions and other current events that we're discussing as a board. And so if I haven't responded to you yet or I'm late in doing so, please uh, do forgive me for that because, again, we are receiving far more emails than we typically do at present. And, uh, Commissioner, that's all for me this morning. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Commissioner Kyler. Thank you. And, and uh, I'll piggyback before I forget on the emails. We've gotten a lot of them, but I'll be straight with the people sending them. The ones that are photocopies of somebody else's without any of your original thoughts, I probably will not answer. But the ones that, that really sent us and talked to us, I will make every attempt to answer. And, and I do want to hear from everybody. Um, I try to say that whenever I can. Oh, certainly happy to hear from everybody, yes. Um, Carroll County Public Schools, I, I saw some stuff on social media, and I think everybody's aware of it. I know we've talked about it here before. Um, there's a state curriculum for health, which you have to opt out of if you don't want to do it. And my, my humble opinion is you should opt out of it and do the Carroll County designed health curriculum. But evidently, a lot of people have opted out, but there was some miswording in it, and you should have gotten emails saying you need to do it again. So I've got a statement from them that says, the link to the Maryland Health Framework that is a choice for families did not contain all the indicators that will be taught. We didn't want families choosing that framework because they were uninformed. So. It's got some more information, but my understanding is even if you opted out the first time, you need to do it again to make it uh, um, that your student will take the county one. Um, on much lighter notes, uh, the as everybody's <clears throat> probably aware, there's an Oreo game Saturday at 1 p.m. 
the uh, division series game one home for the Orioles and I just think that's that's super it's been wow they've been in playoffs but it's probably many 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 years since they've been division champs since 1979 they went over 100 games I think yeah. uh, yes yes and and have over 100 wins so yeah. I, I just think that's awesome Three wins I and uh, we yeah. went on September 30th with uh, my son granddaughter grandson and uh, daughter-in-law and they had already clinched but they did win that day and and just Camden Yards is awesome and uh, Saturday I'm gonna take my the third one back in the picture um, we only have two tickets so mm -hmm. I'm taking my grandson and we'll have a blast and hopefully they win again um, Carroll County Republican Club did uh, a, a law enforcement night and Chief Ledwell, Sheriff DeWeese, State's Attorney Shoemaker, Sen Senator and and some delegates attended that. It was a nice crowd and it's great to hear them speak about law enforcement in Carroll County. We are so fortunate here to have such a safe county and a lot of it is the families and the people that live in Carroll County but we have good law enforcement backing us up went to the Carroll County Realtors um, installation of officers last week and did a photo with the outgoing president and uh, and Brian Lipskin he he was most of the ceremony because the last thing they do is install the new president, um, Terry Bass. But um, just a great, great event. We do need to work hard to get more inventory of houses and property in Carroll County. And this is a, a great group of people. And, and it's interesting, and I'm not going to name a bunch of names. I, I'd like to, but I'll skip some that are important. A lot of these people are also volunteers in the community, active in the community in other ways. They've just opened a new office. It, it's, a, it's a great group, and I was very happy to be part of their installation of new officers. Um, Senator Reedy had an, an outing at uh, Island Green, and that was great. It was great to see a lot of people and hear him talk about Annapolis and what he does and what the delegates do down there. Again, back to I love Carroll County. I think right now I mentioned uh, the school system. I mentioned realtors. I've mentioned the Republican Club. I mentioned delegates and senator. Everybody seems to work together here. It's not a whole lot of bickering. We don't always agree, but we all work together. And I just think that makes Carroll County even greater. Um, went to dill dinkers dill <laughs> dinkers pickleball um will and denise richards um created that entity probably first in Col and maybe in montgomery county maybe in columbia um they now franchise and they've grown their daughter runs a lot of the stuff and she was there their younger daughter actually came up with the name and i just think it's an awesome name and uh it, it's a great facility and that shows you the uh, a court. We cut the ribbon. Um, Commissioner Gordon and I each bored them with a few comments. That's that's <laughs> the lady that um, she's the owner. And uh, um, once we got done boring them, we did the ribbon cutting, and then every court was full with people waiting at each court to get on. It's a uh, it's it's a great way to uh, recreate. And one of the things, and, and uh, I talked about it with a couple of the people there running it, that it reminds me of back with the rec councils and some of the volleyball groups. Um, tennis seemed a little bit more individual, but this volleyball, it, it's like a social network. It's the lobbies as full as the courts sometimes. So if you want to get out and meet some other people that have similar interests, it's a great place to go to do it. Um, tonight is the Carroll Trust annual dinner, and that'll be great, and it'll be great to see all the ag people in the community that do so much in our community. And I think that 
covers it for today. I love Carroll County, and uh, I'm blessed to work with uh, four other great guys, and hopefully we get something done today, right? So who won red or blue? Pickleball. I, I, I know you would have competed Pickleball? against uh, Commissioner Gordon. I mean, no, that, uh, no? The, the chamber wanted us to do like a match until death or something. <laughs> I don't know if pickleball you can really. Most <laughs> two, and two go in, one go out. Exactly. <laughs> we opted out of that option. It surprised me, and, and they had some pros on TV. It's a lot more finesse than it is banging it. Now, my son had a great idea, and uh, neither one of us will probably do it, but if you're listening out there or some of the creative people out here at the table, the pickle ball is like a wiffle ball, a right. little harder, not quite as many holes in it. And, uh, and, and when you hit it, it's loud as shit. <laughs> I mean, it's the don't point. Say, but we don't say those words. Oh, okay. Sean. It's loud. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's yeah. very loud. Um, yeah. And uh, my son <laughs> said saying. people object <laughs> at, at recreation places where there's pickleball going on because the ball sounds so loud. Why can't someone invent a silent pickleball? Oh, I'm on that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm on that right now. Man, Whoever does right, that will be, that out loud. be pretty wealthy. Okay. And, and thank you. I'm, I'm thank just, I'm, I'm thank you to, for setting I'm, me up. I'm about to use the gavel on you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're rich. Commissioner, um, you have to you have to wield that with see, finesse. See what happens when I get off script. He, yeah. he did not write that comment for me. <laughs> I, I apologize. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, so, session, and this is it. what you allowed to happen. It. <laughs> this is what happens. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, definitely with the Orioles. Uh, best of luck to them. Is pretty impressive. They had to change their schedule around to. Uh, start time at 1 p.m. because Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks will be in concert that evening and actually I'll be going to that concert uh, at 7 and they had to figure out the the whole parking ordeal because you have 40 plus thousand at each venue you know and uh, they never thought they would have had to do this not to say they had no doubt that the Orioles were going to be playing the first game and getting the uh, you know, and to AL their credit, series. Major League Baseball was flexible with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Because that, this wasn't the times they wanted, nope. or nor Fox wanted the game to be. Right. So, pretty impressive. Well, to quote Commissioner Kaiser, that concert's going to be loud as. <laughs> 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 Commis uh, Commissioner Kaiser. <laughs> Commissioner Kaiser. Wow. Now the king. Are we having bloopers uh, this morning. Got or the what? He's got the mustache for it. Uh. Okay. <laughs> We, um, we are commissioner, we are digressing here, commissioner President. Gordon, get us, get us thank back you. in order. Take, take I think we'll. I'll take, take us back to where we need to be. So, uh, <laughs> this Saturday, October seventh, the Westminster Fire Department will celebrate their two hundredth anniversary with a parade and fire muster. The parade will occur through downtown Westminster. Uh, antique fire muster will be held at the fire station following the parade, and the parade begins at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, Commissioner Vigliotti and myself will be in attendance at that, and we look forward to seeing everyone out and attending this historic and very monumental uh, moment for the Westminster Fire Department. Um, anyone that subscribes to the county newsletter would have seen uh, the other day, and I just want to mention this for anyone that's not. Uh, October 21st, there will be a disposal of household fire waste, uh, excuse me, hazardous waste shred documents events that's slated for the 21st. Uh, there's a wide array of lists of what is allowed and not allowed for household um, hazardous waste items. Uh, great opportunity to get rid of some of those items that may be in your basement, your garage, and uh, great opportunity to do it in the right fashion and uh, also not affect the environment in doing so. Uh, as Commissioner Kyler mentioned, he and I did attend the opening of Dill Dinkers the other day. Uh, wonderful event. It's very, very uh, packed with the public ready to play. Oh, um, and, and that is the daughter that runs the, pl the place. Gotcha. And okay. yes, yes. And um, just, you know, great to see such an exceptional turnout. Um, as Commissioner Kyler mentioned, they are um, branching out, and I do believe they're looking at going national from what I've understood. Um, as always, great to see another business in Carroll County. And if anyone is looking for recreational opportunities with this sport, it's everything from very uh, social to very competitive, depending on who you get involved with group-wise to play. Um, also, interestingly enough, someone did mention the other day, 
in four out of five of us, not to throw Commissioner Vigliotti under the bus, won't be able to do this, but Commissioner Vigliotti, they also do have a singles pickleball league, so there might be, you know, some scenarios for anyone that's looking to uh, attend or participate in that. How many women play the game? Do you a know? A lot. A lot? A lot. All right. All right. See, it's not just you who derails the conversation. <laughs> okay, this is not matchmaking time. Keep going. I think, also, um, I think okay. one operation and you've totally lost control. <laughs> Keep going. Also, I wanted to uh, mention uh, and bring this to everyone's attention. I had received a couple emails this morning and uh, a couple phone calls last night about this. And usually you hear that and you go, it's a bad thing. This is a great thing. I um, want to give my uh, heartfelt thanks to uh, Chris Swam and staff and everyone involved in lighting our building up for uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The building last night was pink. Um, I know that's very appreciated by many people in the community that we are not only aware but also pointing that out to the public it is definitely a situation that affects a significant number of individuals in our county um, had recently reached out to the health department and uh, they had said that there were 1177 cases uh, previously according to their data and roughly 150 new cases diagnosed as of the last date available um, to anyone out there definitely look into health procedures and, and screenings and such. Also for anyone that is um, in a position that they cannot afford those screenings, do look into this with the health department. There are options. So I just wanted to point that out and uh, bring that awareness to that. Also in reference to our, our building and the Orioles, uh, really appreciate staff last week last Thursday actually lighting it up orange and we had 269 likes on that post so clearly the community appreciates and supports that we are supporting the Orioles and uh, that's all I have today thank you fantastic thanks Tom uh, Commissioner Gary uh, thank you good morning Carroll County uh, just a couple follow-ups I, I I did attend the back the blue event on Tuesday night it was a great event thanks for mentioning that uh, and uh, congratulations to uh, Mercedes Mobis, the president of the uh, Carroll County Republican Club. I won't give the figure, but she, she was very successful in raising quite a bit of funds for, for the police there. And I appreciate Commissioner Kyler bringing up this issue of the opt-out form. As uh, my wife and I got the email and did what we thought was going to work for the opt-out form, um, so it appears that some additional steps are necessary, parents. Uh, I will temper my frustration with that, but I will ask anybody listening from the uh, Carroll County Public School System and the IT shop, please just, whoever needs to find that form online, please just make it as easy as possible. Be prepared for, for a lot of traffic. Um, so parents, uh, make sure you are paying attention to that link and get to it tonight. I also wanted to bring up uh, some good news from Carol, uh, South Carroll High School. As, as a lot of people know, I'm a proud alum, a proud Cav. Um, once a Cav, always a Cav. It's been a rough year for football, uh, so I won't bring that up. Although my, my good friend, uh, Patrick Black, who's a parent coach of the JV team, he's assuring me that this is just a transition period. It's not as bad as it looks, and there's new teams, uh, there's new coaches, there's new plays, and it's going to get better. So. I'm going to take your word on that, Patrick, and, uh, and hope for the best. But the, the golf team recently won the district championship down there, and I am really proud of that group of young men and really proud to say that I've, I know each one of them, and I have known them uh, since they were young, and I knew each one of their families, and they're good people, and they're involved in, uh, in the area down there. Uh, Patrick Carl goes by Patch, Michael Valerio. Uh, Chase Loden and, and Jack Lauer, congratulations to you four. Uh, good luck as you move on, but you've got four just, it, it, they're incredible golfers. They're, and they have golf player names too, which is, <laughs> so you know they're gonna be, you know they're gonna be good. So to those four young men. He yeah, goes right with Tiger. He does, he goes by, he goes by Patch Carl. And, uh, but again, just congratulations to those four young men. And uh, just, it's just fun to watch them succeed in that sport, uh, a extremely difficult sport. So uh, congratulations to them. And uh, in keeping with what I typically do here on Thursday mornings, a little, little bit of a sobering note, and I, I just wanted to bring up this issue because we are starting to see several incidents and events in the county, and I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, I've spoken at length about the issue of, of marijuana use and cannabis in the county, uh, in the state. 
Um, but um, my message to parents who know under your underage parents, you know your kids drink. If you know your kids are using cannabis, they're obviously under 21. To those parents who know that and aren't pushing back on it, who aren't exposing the risks of those two things to your parents, I'm sad to say, but you're not doing it right. And you need to. Uh, drinking's bad enough. We know that there's so much underage drinking going on that the cases of liver disease and things like that are, are going up, and, and I won't get into the statistics, but this cannabis is different. And there's a reason why you have to be 21 to get it. But unlike a beer can or whatever you find in your kid's room and you ask, start asking questions, where'd you get it from, you, you typically know what's in there. But I'm telling you, and I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, you don't know what's in that vape pen or in that joint or whatever. Your underage child is smoking. You simply do not know what's in there. There's a reason why 21 is that age, because we all know that you know when you're young, you make dumb decisions, the, the brain's not fully functions, it's, it's science, we all know that. But my message to those parents, and I say this because I have teenagers and I know exactly what I'm talking about. To those parents out there, you have to start paying attention. And if you're not pushing back on your children and you're sort of looking the other way and just hoping they don't get in the car and, and, and get themselves killed or somebody else killed, you're doing it wrong. And you are not going to get help from anybody to have those discussions. You're not going to get help from any other entity, whether it's a state or local level. I understand we all hear the slogans, we all see the slogans. You know, the children are our future. It takes a village, it takes a community. They're our greatest asset. No, they are your future and they are your asset and they are your responsibility. So please, um, to those parents out there, and again, I bring this up because there have been a few incidents as of late and uh, I don't know all the details and I'm not gonna get into them, but there, there's people have, have come fairly close to losing their lives, young people. So if, if you're watching this, think about what I'm saying. Consider having those discussions. You're not gonna always succeed. I'm not asking you to be a helicopter parent. You hover over your kids. You start going through all their stuff. You start watching everything. You start tracking them. That's not what I'm talking about. But simply put, it is your job to push back on that, to let them know that what they're doing is dangerous. And if you tell them often enough, what I've learned as a parent of three kids, if you tell them long enough, often enough, It'll get through. They actually will hear you at some point. And that's an interesting note, and I think all the other dads up here will back me up. They usually don't listen, but sometimes they do. And if you say something enough, they will hear you. And what I've noticed now that my kids have gotten older is that, wow, they actually were listening part of the time. And, and it only takes that one time. So again, I, I just want to put that out there. It's not a discussion about the, the ballot or the, 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 the law or the dispensaries. That's not what I'm discussing. That's for another time. Everyone already knows my views on that. But it's to the parents in these areas all over the county. Start paying attention because it is happening and it is an issue. And you've got to pay attention because again, once again, your kids, your future, no one's coming to help you. It's just you. <laughs> so take advantage of that opportunity and make sure you're, being, you're, uh, you're having your voice heard. So that's all for me. Thank no, you. I, I appreciate it. And uh, I know with um, two of your colleagues, Kenny and I up here, we've had to deal with this as our children have grown. And, um, you know, I was going to uh, first start by saying, up here on the dais, we don't always take ourselves as seriously, but we do everything we do very seriously. Um, but there are times where we need to be very serious and be very candid, sometimes not with four-letter words, but that's okay. Um, but being just very straightforward and candid. And um, I, I, Mike, I appreciate that message Thank because I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of kids that are getting putting themselves in harm's way and uh, you know um, making poor decisions and not being navigated by parents and others to do what's right um, and uh, this goes from drugs and alcohol to bullying to all the other garbage that's out there um, you know uh, so no very 
very sobering message and very appreciative, at least from me, uh, on what you just shared. Um, as far as football, I know South Carroll's having a tough time, but so is Century. And my son is uh, coaching over there, along with uh, you know being a long-term sub or a full, whatever they call it, a full-time sub over there. Uh, and I don't know if it's transition, I'm not sure, but they're working hard. And I'll tell you, any kid and anybody who decides to put a uniform on, whatever that uniform is, and get out on the field, you know, whether it's a, a singlet, or pads, or a golf club, or running shorts, they may be the best, they may be the worst, but they're willing to get out there and do uh, the best they can. So uh, kudos to the South Carroll football, Century football, and all the other football teams that are out there. Um, and definitely congratulations to the golf team that you mentioned. Um, from South Carroll, last night I attended the uh, Hometown Hero Banners uh, ceremony over at uh, Sykesville and um, strong appreciation and kudos goes to the uh, downtown Sykesville Connect uh, committee run by Julie Della uh, Maria and I want to say this is a long time coming because a lot of the other communities have these banners with uh, service members you know on them we do it so well in Carroll County to recognize our, our veterans Sykesville was challenged, uh, playing by the rules, not having the opportunity to put these banners up on, uh, you know, the the poles and things like that. Well, they finally got uh, the go-ahead. Um, they got some funding uh, from Post 223. For the American Legion was uh, definitely a part of it. Uh, Mayor Link, uh, Stacy was a very strong advocate, along with uh, her entire council. Um, so I went to this uh, event um, early evening yesterday and um, said a few words, but what really you know, sparked me was just how many folks were out there. It was just so cool you know, that folks are recognizing you know, those that are being um, uh, honored, not memorialized, some maybe memorialized, but mostly honored uh, with, with these banners. So really a strong um, kudos to uh, to Julie, Stacy, Post 223. Our American Legions are awesome in this county. I mean, from, uh, I don't want to name all of them. I mean, just, they're just awesome. From all the way down Mount Airy to Hampstead to Sykesville to Westminster and, and every one of them. Uh, so, um, let's see. Next week, I'll be going uh, to Minneapolis with, uh, with Deb Effingham, our uh, Deputy uh, administrator, which is part of the Baltimore Metropolitan Committee Council. Council, <laughs> and uh, you know we do this once a year with different communities across the country, looking at best practices and opportunities to share ideas um, and what to bring back to the region. So it's not just Carroll County, but it's um, Baltimore, Anne Arundel, Howard, uh, Harford, and Carroll. You know, coming together and going forward and uh, we'll be out there for a couple days. Then after that, uh, the following week, um, we'll be going up to New York City and we'll be looking forward to putting our best foot forward and continuing to highlight just how cool Carroll County is and how strong Carroll County is fiscally uh, being responsible who we are. And uh, coming back with a strong report is what I would expect and uh, I'm hoping those that may come forward will also share that same attitude. Uh, so looking forward for uh, Commissioner Kyler and I, along with our awesome staff going forward to uh, the city in a couple weeks. The last thing I wanna say, uh, just on uh, another unfortunate sobering note, Morgan State, uh, a day or so ago, there was a, a violent shooting where five people were shot and four of them students. And you think about this, I mean, those that are going to schools, I mean, it's, it's hard enough to get away from, you know, like uh, Commissioner Garen, you said about the drugs and alcohol. It's, it's hard enough to do that. It's, you know, it's hard enough to just do the things you want to do, and then all of a sudden, four kids are go no longer going to school right now because they got shot. 
in, uh, at Morgan State. I don't know all the details, to be honest. I just got the headlines, um, and I don't want to get into details. It's just I'm getting tired of the violence, you know, uh, but just wanting to share my thoughts for them to have strength and courage in their recoveries uh, in moving forward. Um, okay, that's about all for now. Why don't we go into a, uh, I believe, a proclamation, Commissioner Guerin, you may have. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we've got some, we've got three VIPs here this morning. If you want to come up and have a seat with us, it is uh, Chief Michael Robinson, who is the director and chief of our Carroll County Department of Fire and EMS. President Susan Mott, she is the president of a CCV, so that is an organization that represents the many, many volunteers. And then we've got Lieutenant Mike Karolinko, who is the president of the uh, International Association of Firefighters, Local 5184. So welcome to all three of you. Who's fighting fire? Who's fighting fires if you guys are all here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've got a proclamation. As Commissioner Rossi mentioned, it is Fire Prevention Week, and I have noticed around the county the banners and things up at the uh, at our stations everywhere. So I just think that's wonderful, and I can I can see mine. I can you can see them right from the road. So whoever's putting these up, they're doing a great job. Um, please pass that along, President Mott. So, again, Fire Prevention Week is October 8th to October 14th. Carroll County is committed to preserving the safety and security of all those living in and visiting our county. And fire is, fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally. And homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire. Between 2016 and 2020, home fires cost, caused on average 2,610 civilian deaths in the United States, according to the National Fire Protection Association and fire departments of the United States responded to, on average, 343,100 home fires in that same period. According to the uh, NFA, NFPA, cooking is the leading cause of home fires, with nearly half of all home fires involving cooking equipment. Cooking is also the leading cause of home fire injuries, with unattended cooking as the leading cause of home cooking fires and related deaths. The 2023 Fire Prevention Week campaign Cooking safety starts with you. Pay attention to fire prevention. Promote safety tips, guidelines, and recommendations that can help significantly reduce the risk of having a cooking fire, including always keep a close eye on what you're cooking. For foods with longer cooking times, such as those that are simmering or baking, set a timer. Clear the cooking area of combustional items and keep anything that can burn, such as dish towels, oven mitts, away from those areas. Turn pot, holder, pot handles toward the back of the stove. We were taught that as a kid. Keep a lid nearby when cooking. If a small grease fire, slide the lid over the pan and turn off the burner. And create a kid and pet free zone of at least three feet around the cooking area and anywhere else hot food or drink is prepared to carry. This campaign is, is a message to educate the public on how to reduce the leading cause of home fires in Carroll County. Carroll County first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. Carroll County residents that are responsive to public education matters are better able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Carroll County Commissioners, do by proclaim October 8th to 14th, 2023, as Fire Prevention Week. And again, thank all three of you for you. being here. Chief Robinson, you have a few comments about this? I'm sure you uh, do. Yes, and it, of course I do. <laughs> I should have done this last week when I lost my voice. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, this is the 101st uh, commemoration of Fire Prevention Week, and Fire Prevention Week has its origins in the uh, Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which took 250 lives. So uh, this is actually the 101st, not anniversary of the fire, but of Fire Prevention Week, which always occurs during the week, which includes October 9th, which historically is the day of the Great Chicago Fire. Um, the cooking theme is very appropriate because, again, it is the number one cause of our fires. Uh, one of the biggest issues with cooking fires is typically uh, human behavior will take over. You see a cooking fire, people tend to try to extinguish that fire. Usually they'll take water, 
Most of these fires are grease, and all that does is spread the fire and cause injuries. So we want to emphasize uh, that people evacuate their uh, residents should they come across a cooking fire, turn off the burner, whether it's gas or electric, electric. and it's always good if you're doing any kind of frying to keep uh, the large lids for your pots or your frying pans, and covering that will take away the oxygen and will actually put out the fire. Uh, fire extinguishers, water, all those kinds of things typically uh, accelerate those fires. Um, during this week, uh, we will have our stations out visiting all the elementary schools. Uh, some volunteer stations will be having open houses. And again, I'd like to reiterate, as uh, Commissioner Gordon spoke about, is it'll be a very large event at Westminster to celebrate their uh, 200th anniversary. And there will be displays there uh, on fire prevention. So it's actually now, we've extended fire prevention week. It's really now fire prevention month. And fire prevention should be a year-round occurrence. Uh, through the efforts in the last 50 years uh, with fire prevention, we've actually reduced by 50 percent the number of fire fatalities. If we go back to the 70s, we were losing uh, over 5,000 people a year. Now that number is uh, down to about 2,500. So the efforts are working. Uh, you don't need firefighters to tell you how to handle these things. Um, everybody needs to just have situational awareness and act accordingly. If you go to our home page on the Carroll County site, we will have a number of links and uh, materials uh, to focus on that awareness. So we thank the uh, board for recognizing this week. Lieutenant? Well, just uh, we look forward to uh, you know for the first time being uh, Department of Fire and EMS employees with the county, uh, getting out and building those relationships with the kids in the schools, um, and uh, it's just an awesome opportunity. A lot of times coming to the station, so it's a great partnership uh, between the volunteer and the career aspects to be able to uh, bring those lessons to the kids. You know, if you have any doubt of the severity or the seriousness of what we're discussing with the chief so eloquently built out, um, go to YouTube. You know, you can see how fast these things evolve. So yeah. just like we train and we take seriously creating muscle memory uh, for stressful scenarios, we really encourage everybody to take that seriously and train and practice these drills at home. It's not a joke. It's not just silly. Uh, when something bad happens, you're going to really appreciate the fact that you practice at first. So really uh, appreciate you uh, bringing attention here. And uh, it's going to be a, a good week, a good month. And we're uh, looking forward to it. Thanks, Lieutenant. Appreciate it. President Mott. Not a whole lot left to say. I've <laughs> taken my thunder away from everything. The volunteers uh, typically every year uh, celebrate this week with having kids come into the stations. We go out to the schools. Um, the, so this year, as we combine with CCD FEMS, we're able to put even more information out and more people available to educate not just the children but the adults uh, that's very important because as adults we tend to get a little bit complacent until the children remind us mm -hmm. and we have different events that will give the children and adults the ability to prevent fires and i thank you very much for recognizing all of this thank you absolutely any uh, comments or i'll just say up here Thank you very much for doing what you do. And, and I think it's important to remember, too, that, that you, you don't just talk about these things, but you live them, right? And, and the key component of, of all of this is not even just the, the, the sense of what you do. It's trying to educate people about preventing these things from happening in the first place. And so I think that what the three of you and everybody are doing with this is incredibly important because, again, you create that, that sense of, like you said, uh, uh, you know, the muscle memory, so to speak, about this, right? You, you get yourself into good habits because the education has kicked in and these become customs that you, you practice. Up, and drop, and roll. <laughs> there, Every there you kid go. The world knows that one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, so I, I can't thank the three of you enough for what you do, not just on a day in and day out basis, but for taking the time and the effort to educate all of us about safe practices. So God bless the three of you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? It's just thank you very much, and, and thank you to everyone throughout the county. We got a a lot of volunteers, a lot of paid people that, that spend a lot of time protecting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just think that, uh, you know, all those in red, blue, and green, you know, you wear the uniform certain parts of the day, but you're 
attitudes and professionalism is 24 7 you know you're always uh a fireman you're always a policeman policewoman you're always in the military i mean it's just that it's that personality it's that attitude it's that selfless service you know uh so really appreciate because you demonstrate the best we have and um you know uh you go well and beyond you know and uh really really do appreciate that especially with the schools you know that they look up to our men and women in red blue and green and not shy away from them so the more you're out there the better we are so thank you thank you sir I would just say thank you sincerely and obviously Carroll County is safer because of you and all that you're representing here today and thank all of them obviously not all in attendance but we greatly appreciate all the volunteers and paid fire and EMS thank you sir thank you okay why don't we uh, do a happy snap Matt will come out of the magic door <laughs> Okay, ladies, why don't you come on up and let's talk about an approval of a resolution consideration of bond authorization, authorizing resolution. That's a lot of resolution. It is. We're going to come to I feel a like resolution. I got two resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> two, two, uh, two resolutions in there, ladies. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning Good to morning. both of you. Joining me is Emily Fusting from our bond council firm, McKinnon, Shelton, and Hen. Uh, we're before the board this morning. For our annual process, we lead into a bond financing. As Commissioner um, Rothstein said, we'll be going to New York next week. Week after. Week after. I've got. You can go next week. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean, you. Not without you guys. No. <laughs> um, for the bond rating analyst to review the, our financials and, and give us our good news ratings, right? Right. Um, so your action today would be to consider the resolution which would authorize the issuance of $30 million worth of tax exempt bond financing. Um, this is used to finance multiple projects. I've included in your listing the projects that this $30 million would cover. Um, it includes a lot of public school projects as well as a uh, majority of water shed projects that have been approved through the CIP process. Um, we'll be advertising the bond sale on the first two weeks of November and holding that the sale on November 16th. Um, and at that time, we'll be back in front of you with the hopefully good news of the rates, although rates are increasing okay. over last year with the market to be expected. Um, so I will ask Ms. Fustig to walk you through the resolution which they have prepared. Yes, good morning, everyone. I see some familiar faces and some new faces, so uh, right. thank you for having me here today. Morning. Um, I don't know if you already have what I just passed around, but it was just a that's copy okay, of the resolution, okay. <laughs> just in case I wanted to bring it. Um, so uh, thank you to Jenny for the introduction. And yes, so this is um, really the second step in terms of the approvals for a bond financing. The county does typically issue bonds every year. Um, first, the state does approve uh, bond authorizing amounts for the county. And then we come before you all with specific projects every year that the county intends to finance. So what this bond resolution is doing is it is authorizing a not to exceed amount. We might come in under that, um, but a, a maximum amount we could issue this year for these projects. Um, it is authorizing the county to go out and publish a notice of sale 
which is how the prospective bidders on the bonds know that we're going to hold this bond sale in November. The county typically has numerous bidders. Um, various banks will come in and place online bids at the bond sale to get you all the, the hopefully best interest rate available in the market on those days. And so what this is authorizing is what that form of bond would look like, what that notice of sale would look like, and then we would come back before you after the bond sale on the sale day to report back as to what the best rate is that we've received from the bids, what those finals numbers are, and get that final approval from you all before actually approving the sale and issuing the bonds. Is there anything that is, is significantly or dramatically different from years past? No. This is a very um, traditional financing this year. It is also just new money. Um, some years when rates are particularly low, we'll also have a refunding where we'll refund prior bonds with higher rates. This year, there's nothing um, that the financial advisors for the county have identified as um, eligible to save you money on a refunding. So this is a, a traditional uh, new money issuance, really standard projects, a very standard issuance. Thank you. What are the rates? <laughs> um, so I know Jenny looked them up this morning, um, and I think they're around like 4.1, 4.2. So Jennifer Derrickson told me this morning that Cecil County issued last week at 4.1. Okay. Oh, um, and she would expect us to be probably around lower fours. Of course, that can change sure. depending on what the markets are from now till bond sale in a month. Um, but that's where they're at right now. Yeah, the benefit of the county's great rating and the, the mm -hmm. public sale process that the county goes through is you really know that you're getting on that day really right. what the best rate in the market is. And the county's financial advisor, what they do is they also will monitor the market going up to the sale. Um, it happens very rarely, but there have been years where they suggest the sale gets either pushed forward or backward a little bit, mm -hmm. so they are constantly monitoring that as well. And then for the edification of uh, myself, my colleagues in the community, the rates um, range from where we are as strong as we are, you know, right now, to if we weren't as strong as we were, would it be a dramatic difference in rate change? I mean, if we were not as showing as a triple triple A's we are, um, and we only got two out of the three type of thing. What's the? It would definitely be higher. I can't give you the exact range. Um, I'm not sure what that, but it would definitely be higher because that would be the risk, the right. bond, um, the banks and the bond buyers would yeah. be taking on our county. So the fact that we are triple, triple A, we're a lower risk, which means we should get the best yeah. rate. And, and that's really what people. it comes down to is being as strong as we are, it's telling the banks in the bank community that we are at the minimal risk mm -hmm. um, in issuing these bonds. So, which is again, uh, kudos to everyone, you know, and how we do our business. So, okay. Motion to approve the bond authorizing resolution is presented by bond council. Second. I have a motion, I have a second. Thank you ladies very much. Is there any discussion? Seeing here none all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Okay, let's talk about uh, request for public hearing regarding Babylon Road closure. Good morning, gentlemen. Good, Good morning, morning, commissioners. I apologize, just real quick. Uh, Chris, is there anyone on the line? No, sir. Okay, thanks. Gentlemen. Good morning. The Department of Public Works for some time has been working to replace the structure on Babylon Road due to significant environmental uh, impacts. The estimated construction cost to replace that is over $1.85 million at this time. Babylon Road structure over Silver Run is located just north of Cump Station Road and Mayberry Road. It is a single lane acro panel truss with steel floor beams and a stringer structure built in 1960 with some minor repairs to the abutments in 2016. 
The structure is inspected every two years with the actual truss being inspected every year. It's currently restricted to 24,000 pounds for single axle and 43,000 pounds combination. As we work through this process and evaluate the environmental impacts of the proposed alignment, it was determined that the replacement structure um, is going to have significant environmental impacts to over 11,850 square feet of wetland. This alignment utilizes the current right-of-way that we own and then we turn back as quickly as, as we can back to Babylon Road. This turn back to, to reduce the impacts over the 11,850 will, will require additional right-of-way that we don't own at this time. As we progress through the design, um, we estimated the, um, the replacement costs of $1.85 million, which the county will be responsible for their share, of, which will be about $625,000. That includes right-of-way and, and wetland costs. Traffic counts recently collected in May of 2023 were 85 vehicles per day uh, in the area of the structure. So far, the county has paid an estimated $65,000 uh, for the design costs. It's estimated if we were to stop our design at this time, we would be responsible for about $148,000 of design costs uh, that the federal government state highway has paid. With this project not billing, being fully funded in the CIP at this time and the limited traffic on this roadway, substantial construction costs and environmental impacts, we are recommending that a public hearing be held to close this structure or this roadway at the time this structure is no longer serviceable, meaning it would stay open until our inspectors have said this structure can no longer sustain the weight of traffic and then we would close the road permanently. Are you saying that we've put in 148,000 to this? What we have we have put in sixty five thousand over sixty five thousand. Now we typically pay twenty percent of the design costs, and right. state highway, federal highway, pay eighty percent. If we were to stop the design where we are now, we would be responsible for one hundred forty eight thousand, one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. We've had some cost sharing challenges with this project already in regards to state highway and us. We've worked those out, um, but our repayment we estimate. Right now, it would be around one hundred forty-eight, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, thanks, Chris. All right, so walk me through this very so just so I understand. So this bridge was set to be replaced, um, but due to unforeseen circumstances, based on the impact that it would have, the construction would have on surrounding wetlands, that increased the cost significantly, to the point where the recommendation now is to leave the bridge open as long as humanly possible while it's safe to leave it open. And then what happens? And then the, the road, so, so again, um, uh, what you have said to that point is correct. Um, we, we have, and I would let the, the commissioners know, uh, in previous boards, we have um, explored and exhausted other options to take um, a lower cost route that wouldn't go through wetlands. Those options have not been successful uh, in negotiations. So uh, I also want to let you know that we haven't done this in a vacuum. We have consulted with both um, all of our public safety agencies to include fire and rescue and law enforcement uh, if this should come to pass that, that uh, you all would decide to go to public hearing. Now, with that being said, then it, yes, the, the structure um, is, is on the list, but the longer that we keep this project going forward, the more potential that we incur to pay back a greater deal to, uh, you know, federal and state government for any sharing as we do that. And particularly since it is not funded in the CIP, there really is no way for us to move forward because the funding uh, simply isn't there uh, to you know to construct this and when you look at the numbers uh, you know quite frankly it has become a very costly project uh, for the amount of traffic that that structure would see but yes going through the wetlands in, in a final short answer becomes a very costly proposition and really expands the cost of it, of that structure and and so forgive me um, and I'm not trying to be rebarbative I no. promise so 
I'm, I'm imagining that the replacement bridge could not be constructed within the footprint that currently exists for... That's correct. Yes. And I'm imagining that has nothing to do with us. It has to do with, with environmental regulations, whatever. So that's kind of almost like a paradox, isn't it? Kind of ironic, right? That they say you have to do it this way, but because you're doing it that way, you're destroying the environment that you're supposed to be protecting. It's God bless you at the same time. So it's... Yeah. Well, and again, there... Um, we could there be another avenue other than the wetlands there could but the county does not own that property to not go through the wetland and uh, as I said earlier negotiations uh, failed in attempts to to gain that property so we are forced with what the county already owns which unfortunately is through wetland areas so I just want to be clear that there would be a cheaper alternative coming off of that bridge we just haven't been successful in in purchasing that land and how often is the bridge inspected so, uh, go ahead. so it's the overall inspections every two years but because it's this type of trust bridge the connections are inspected yearly right okay so we have eyeballs on yeah. it yearly and we we always want to make sure as you can see from the picture that chris has displayed there is not a great this is a blue sky day and uh, with little water there's not a great deal of distance between the top of the water line and the bottom of the structure which meaning any time that steel gets water uh, that causes even greater concern for either debris or just the water itself or other contaminants uh you know having an issue with the bridge and and we're before you today because i think it is very important you all just recognized it today with our October being uh, you know safety month and we did it last month with preparedness month we're being prepared we're preparing you what we're saying is we don't want to get to the 10th thing and come before you and say oh my goodness the sky is falling and the bridge must close with that's that's not our thing our thing is do we have time now let's make a conscious and educated decision that we want to you know if when time comes to pass that the investment is going to be too much and we close it are we prepared meaning that we can literally go ahead and you know put the message out we can prepare the signs we can have everything in place that should our bridge engineer get out there and inspect it goodness forbid a couple couple months from now and say hey we, we can't do anything more with that then it's a simple notification we must enact this part uh, and we put the signs up and we move on from there. So, so that's our whole goal here is to, to bring before you and not allow our, our customers, our taxpayers to throw good money after bad. And unless we have another option, that's what we're doing. I, and I, I, so I, I totally take that point. I guess my concern is that, concern about obviously about the, the, the fair rating of the structure, but, mm -hmm. but you know, so again, just walk me through this. We get to the end of the, the you know, reliability of the bridge, <laughs> yep. right? And the bridge gets closed. I mean, do, at that point, do we even attempt to replace the bridge, or is it it's closed forever at that point? It would be forever. closed and removed. Yes. And we you said would. about eighty some people use or eighty some vehicles use this this road every day. Yeah. So we, I have had, uh, you know, historically, and particularly uh, when Commissioner Wance was here through the last administration, we we had one gentleman who uh, was emailing, uh, you know, without going into those names. I proactively uh, sent an email to him. Uh, he's a local doctor here in the county, has lived on the road for years. I would let you know two things. Uh, one, that he was very appreciative of the uh, surface hardening that was done on the road. He had been a proponent of that for many years, and two. Um, he understood uh, that when it got to that point about the investment of tax dollars so he had no issue with that and he appreciated the follow-up uh, to let him know because I, I was indeed didn't want to do anything in the blind and let him know that our intent was to come before you with this with this thing now of course we may see other people and that's the whole point of the public hearing our point here only today is to ask you to have the public consider that and then it would again become your decision if the answer was no we'd have to have another discussion are we going to fund any more money in the CIP or what's your intent so, and so basically today you guys just want the public hearing to be able to have the public come talk about this have citizens come talk okay yeah that that's required yep mm -hmm. or the decision is to move forward yep no public hearing i think i'd rather do the public hearing to be honest rather that's, hear what citizens who live there have to say about it and, and you know that's our thought because again that that gives you a gauge that if you if you do get you know a many that do it then again that's other consideration for how the money's spent mm -hmm. uh, because ultimately we will have to do something this is another one of those issues that a bridge or structure built in the 1960s um you know there will come a time that we have to make that decision right 
right? This bridge is posted. Has it been for a long time? And yes. then what's the next steps? Would, would the posting, would the restrictions change or the next steps close it? We'll get it down to about 6,000 pounds and then we'll, yep. then we'll close it. Or we may get to a point where we have a member that is deteriorated that it, go, it could go from, from here, the next inspection they go, well, this member is, is beyond repair you got to close it mm -hmm. yeah. so and you you know you don't know what that is you, you have discussed with us we're experiencing another bridge in the county where we it gets to a certain point and even though that particular bridge is up for replacement you know we don't have that magic we we do the best we can with getting out and, and using our techniques of inspection today but there are some times when it literally just happens and we have to take action okay any other uh Bless you. Bless, you. bless you. Any discussion regarding this? Motion to go to a public hearing for the closure of Babylon Road Bridge. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Thank you, gentlemen. Any discussion? Seen here. None. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we're going to talk about truck uh, restrictions regarding Brown Road. Are there any public comments either on the phone or in here? <laughs> Seeing none. Gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. So we're here today to recommend the restriction of vehicles over 26,000 gross vehicle pounds, gross vehicle weight, uh, for Brown Road to travel from Old Westminster Pike to Lawndale Road. That would be a through. Any any local trips, local deliveries, anything like that, they would still be allowed. But this is traveling from one end all the way to the other. We received a request uh, in regards to this road, and we also had uh, have had a large truck stuck uh, on this road that our staff had to work to help them get out. Currently, according to Google Maps, uh, it's 1.4 miles from Old Westminster Pike to Lawndale Road, and with a travel time of about three minutes. Round Road in the area of Old Westminster Pike and Arabian Drive is a two-lane, 20-foot wide roadway with a center line and edge line. As you get further through the roadway towards Lawndale Road, it reduces down to 13 feet, and in some places may be a little bit narrower than that. Mm. The roadway has several horizontal vertical curves. In one area, it's a 90 degree turn at the top of the grade. Uh, current traffic counts that were collected were found that we have 459 vehicles per day in the area of Old Westminster Pike and 188 vehicles in the area of Lawndale Road. We don't have a lot of through traffic uh, on this roadway. If we were to place restrictions on this roadway, here are the two options that motorists have to get from Old Westminster Pike and Brown Road to Lawndale and Brown Road. They could use Maryland 140 to Maryland 91 to Lawndale Road, distance of 5.1 miles and travel time of about nine minutes. Or you could go Old Westminster Pike to Maryland 140 to Sandy Mount Road to Lawndale Road, distance of 3.5 miles, time of about six minutes. So again, it's the department's recommendation that this roadway be posted for a 26,000 pound vehicle restriction. That would uh, keep all your delivery vehicles and things of that nature, but it would not allow tractor trailers, loaded dump trucks, you know those those type of heavy construction and and trucks to travel through if you're having a water delivery for your pool no problem if you're having a, you know any stone on your driveway your driveway repaved no problem you know if you live on that road and try and drive one of these vehicles that's fine as long as you make a stop on that road just prohibiting the through trips yeah and uh, commissioners obviously you know uh, because you hear uh, about traffic all the time we don't take any you know traffic question lightly we evaluate them all we evaluate them all seriously mm -hmm. and when uh, it we see it as a needed issue we bring it to your attention in this case as Chris mentioned earlier 
uh, with the with the safety of the traveling public and the fact that we have had vehicles get stuck in portions of this road and most critically we wouldn't come to you with this unless we had a couple of detour routes which you see up that we believe are detour routes that are reasonable uh, and uh, you know both in mileage and time that would allow this to occur because we do understand you know business travels over all of our roads they have to have roads to be able to conduct their business uh, but we are also very sensitive to our number one priority which is the safety of our traveling public so that's why we're here before you today any questions are you asking us uh, or requesting that we take a look at either option one or no. option No, two? we just brought those to your attention okay. to demonstrate yeah. that there are viable options so that okay. one couldn't say, well, great, you're doing that and there's no way for us to get around. That's I've got to go 100 miles. Okay. You know, no, the, the, the decision here is about the 26,000. Yes, sir. Okay. That yes. Correct. I'm not sure. um, okay. The law does require that, that there be a viable option. Sure. And yep. obviously, we want, wouldn't want to cause undue cost to anybody that right. is using that roadway. Well, the detour routes are fairly reasonable compared to the through trip. Okay. okay. Thanks. If we were to make this change, um, is there any, I guess, policy or procedure in which we'd, uh, and I don't mean enforce in a strong sense, but sort of educate the public and those that have been using this for some time? That this has now been changed or are we just primarily looking at putting up um, signage and such I was just kind of curious so we, we put signs up we put a plaque and flags over top of the and to make people aware of it and obviously from an enforcement standpoint there is somewhat of a grace period for people but they're right there when you so if you're going to turn on the road and you're driving a vehicle that would be restricted um, you would know you would see it before you make the turn to get onto the vehicle onto the yeah. roadway and we do work hand in hand. Uh, in fact, uh, we dashed out of a meeting uh, with yes. Captain DeBoard and uh, Mario regarding the upcoming uh, sign installation because how we work hand in hand is while those signs come in, uh, roads, engineering, and Department of Public Works, we put them up. So that we talk about all these issues on a regular basis. So their traffic enforcement team will be well aware of this and as Chris mentioned, to educate people as they come along. Uh, the sheriff and his team are, are very nice in that respect that, hey, it just started, you know, yep. let's not come through again. Thank Doug, you. Doug, honestly, I can see you and Chris being dashing, but being dashed over here, uh, it's a different story. We dashed. Uh, okay. Upstairs. Just, just saying. I took the stairs. Okay. Um, any other discussion on this? Motion to approve the through travel restriction of 26,000 pounds gross vehicle weight for Brown Road. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing here, none all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now we're going to talk about closure of a portion of Pinch Valley Road and a traffic analysis follow-up. Are there any public comments that want to be made prior to this discussion? Okay, why don't we uh, just take a second, um, fill out the salmon color card and... Uh, Commissioner, while we're waiting, um, if I may, Mr. Bryant, can you, can you, I'm going back to the Babylon Road issue, so I apologize. What was the cost of that again if we move forward? You had a ballpark of 1.805 okay, million in construction costs. Okay, thank you. And our portion of that would be approximately $625,000. Okay, thank you. That's county dollars. Okay, and Chris, I just want to ensure there's no one on the line, correct? No, sir. Okay, so let's just take a small tactical pause and Terry you ready huh? are you trying to be funny are you trying to be like somewhat jovial yes. okay I think the first is Miss Tara Battaglia why don't you come on up and say again your name and your residence Thank you. Uh, my name is Tyra Battaglia. I live at 1229 Woods Road, which is adjacent to Pinch Valley Road. Um, you know, lately I've also noticed a lot of noise pollution from the airport. And what I mean by that is we have now jets that are coming in and out that are currently flying over the Pinch Valley Woods Road, Hugh Shop Road area. Um, and right now I got a concern regarding is my property tax value going to drop? Is the value of my home going to drop? And 
in whatever amount of time that my family lives there, are we going to be able to sell our home when the airport expansion is done? I highly doubt it. I mean, we hear complaints on the news from BWI and people that live in that area and how it has gotten busier and busier. Um, when we purchased our home, there was no disclosure of the airport expansion happening or Pinch Valley Road being closed. I do find it interesting that we're going to give a homeowner um, purchasing 36 acres of their property over a hundred and some thousand dollars when they don't even live in those homes. They're Airbnbs. That's a little of an issue to me. I mean, it, we're going to give someone money, but they don't even live in the one house where there's going to be a cul-de-sac built in. Um, I mean, is do they even have a license to be able to do that? That's a good question. Is that property an ag preserve? Because it is currently ag property that's being used. There's animals, there's crops. I mean, what about the wetlands that are there, the wildlife protection signs that have been adjacent there? And not just with Pinch Valley Road being closed, but now they're also talking about expanding 97. So how are the residents supposed to get where they need to go Hugh Shop Road and 140 is a horrible intersection. So these traffic study that was done, did they even look at that? Did they look at how the traffic would be increased there at the intersection of Hugh Shop Road and 140? What about Indian Valley Trail? What has been looked there? Is that going to be widened before Pinch Valley Road is closed so people can get to where they need to go to 97 Pleasant Valley Road there's just, this seems rushed. And I know I hear that the airport expansion's been in the works for 20 years, but in 20 years, did no one look at these things? Did no one ask the residents or go to the doors of them or stand at the properties and, and listen and hear what is happening in that area? And I think, just slow this down. I I'm sorry, but taking money from the federal government to expand the airport, at what cost? And it could be the tax money you receive from your from your residents. So thank you. No, thank you. Ed Cuban. Good morning. 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 Um, it's my understanding on the agenda that um, with regard to Pinch Valley. Oh, I didn't say who I was. Edmund Cumin, Ned, <laughs> twelve oh one Woods Road, Westminster, Maryland. Um, uh, then on your agenda uh, are a couple items. One dealing with the closure. I know you've acted officially to close the road, but the uh, back in March, um, uh, I think we understood that there were going to be some study of this and that on your agenda that um, DPW has two proposals uh, to do a, a, a thorough traffic study um, that uh, uh, the only thing that concerned me was that uh, on the on the one with the land acquisition uh, DPW was making a motion to recommend that you proceed with those acquisitions for easements, but on the traffic study there was no no motion to do that. Now there may be a very good reason for that. Maybe they just want the board, but I s I'm just here to urge the board to perform the necessary traffic study um, that's going to need to be done. I think. Uh, I had, you know, suggested that you all take a trip out there and understand <coughs> that when this road is physically closed, you're pushing everything over to uh, Indian Valley Trail. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with Indian Valley Trail, um, you need to be, and that's something that um, a traffic study would uh, embrace the conditions of that road and what needs to be done and the implications uh, on all the other intersections at 140 and Hughes Shop 
140 and Royal Road, uh, Meta Branch. So I'm just urging you to uh, perform, get that study performed, and let's see what what it is. Also, I think there was some kind of the DPW did some sort of study, put um, counters out or something this spring. I, I didn't see see that for myself, but I'm not home all the time. And uh, so I, I'd be really interested to see what those numbers have come up with. But the trick would be, for sure, this is all the result of the airport. And I, for one, as a taxpayer, think the federal government should be picking up the tab for any expenses that the county may incur for redoing Indian Valley Trail or maybe making another road that goes parallel to Pinch Valley Road, whatever. That, that's happening already down on Meadow Branch Road. There's money there that's come in. And um, so uh, all I'm urging is that you, you get that traffic study so you can see you know, what the upshot of this is going to be. Uh, so it's being proactive, just like yep. you were talking about earlier. So thank you for your yes, time. Sir. Thank you. And both uh, Ned, Tara, I appreciate both your comments. Very well thought out, um, just personally speaking, and uh, took a lot of notes on what both of you shared. OK, gentlemen, who's starting? I lost it again. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Morning. Uh, on March 2nd, 2023, the board conducted a public hearing, and on March 25th, the board uh, signed a resolution closing approximately 2,700 2, linear feet uh, of Pinch Valley Road for, for the safety enhancement project at the Carroll County Regional Airport. Uh, the slide here that I have up now is show, shows that closed area. There will be a cul-de-sac at each end. Um, this show. This is a cut through the area. This shows where Pinch Valley Road will, will uh, ultimately be once we do the, the grading for the, the new runway. Uh, so you can see it's it's approximately. Uh, I want to say it's like. 50 I, I apologize. Feet just real quick. Can you hear in the back? Can Can you hear Eric in the back? Okay. I just want to make sure. Thanks. See, so yeah, it, sh it shows the uh, how much fill will be over top of Pinch Valley Road. For the new runway, um, this is this slide shows the existing wetlands and stream that are in the area that uh, that um, people have mentioned. Uh, they, they will be mitigated, and uh, this next slide shows that we will, the, the mitigation uh, the the wetlands will be established elsewhere, and um, the, the the water that flows through that area will be put through this uh, box culvert, or yeah, the box culvert. Um, so the public hearing. The board requested that DPW perform some traffic analysis on the area impacted by the closure. And so now I'll now pass it over to Chris Lanachin to discuss the data collected by the Bureau of Engineering. Thank you. So in uh, March of 2023, we collected uh, traffic counts using the road tubes as we was referred to. And you can see uh, on the slide we, uh, where we collected the counts. And Eric, I guess we'll go to the next slide. Maybe it's a little, it's a little easier to see. Um, we have the area of, of Pinch Valley area uh, that we, was collected. Uh, on the north side of the closure, we're seeing 175 cars a day. That's a 72-hour count. We collected for three days. We averaged on, on those three days, and we have a, 175 uh, average vehicles in a 24-hour period. So in a 10-hour normal peak you know, day, we're saying about 17, 18 cars. Just north of Indian Valley Trail, we have 163 cars. And as we work out towards uh, Hughes Shop Road and 140, the volumes increase as the density increases. Uh, so we see most of those, those folks that are using this roadway are traveling out to 140 and Hughes Shop Road. Uh, we don't see a lot of traffic. There are people. There are people that are going through the area that will be closed, um, but nothing like we see uh, towards Hughes Shop and 140, those volumes. Um, obviously, they're trying to get to 140 um, as quickly as they can, and that's <laughs> the shortest and easiest way uh, to get to where they're going. Um, 
we have counts on um, Indian Valley Trail um, fairly low and we see the highest towards uh, Pinch Valley uh, lower towards the Pleasant Valley so we see folks coming south uh, Indian Valley to Pinch Valley obviously getting to, to 140 What would um, a full traffic study, if performed, be different than what you have already done? It depends what you ask them to look at. Right. Um, are you looking at level Fair. of service based on highway capacity or, or other uh, methods of evaluation? Um, are you going to look at intersection turning movements? We don't have. We don't know. These are bi-directional counts just numbers the, right you know we we can see based on where the the numbers where the numbers are which direction you know most of the traffic's going um if we were to see say pinch valley a pleasant valley we were to see a very large number we'd say oh well most of these people are going north right. instead of south right. um the um the cost associated with doing a additional traffic study uh beyond this scope like you're describing um how long does that typically take i mean is it a three-day period of time or i mean i i know it would be up to us what we so decide, but the, inter the intersection counts are typically a 24-hour they're done by video now okay um and the the video counts are actually extrapolated and put into the software and then analysis is done um so the counts are only in only a, normally a a.m. p.m. peak and maybe a Saturday peak if you if you have a generator that is high in the Saturday here we probably ask them for a 24-hour count but um, normally normally a traffic count only has a.m. and p.m. peaks they don't give you a, a full day it's just for me making a decision on partial information although albeit you know important information provided it still doesn't have the full picture um so we're speculating you know and assuming this is what the vehicles are doing um the, we, the, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, you don't know unless you do a very specialized study yeah and do a origin destination with license plate you don't know where that vehicle starts and where it, right. it ends we can just again even with the detail counts we can speculate that we have 75 here and 24 right. making a right and we can see on the other unless we do an origin destination which we've done very few and, and small sampling of those yeah um you don't know where they start and where they end and normally it would only be say at hugh shop and pinch valley and and pinch valley and pleasant valley whether they made that through trip and those are costly if you do a, a, an actual origin destination I'm just wondering the one if we were to add on another attempt to do a, a further in-depth look at a, a traffic study um, what the impact would have would it just verify what we already know um, maybe um, or would it say hey this is now with all these things put in place we're prepared to make a decision that will have effects on people's you know community um, I don't know I'm just kind of I, I don't want to say I like to spend money and uh, throw it around and I don't and everybody should know that but um, I also don't want to make decisions on impacting a community if I haven't used all the resources I have available I'm in agreement with that, Commissioner. And, and oh. the other thing, too, I'd, I'd like more information about, and I understand that the purpose of today was specifically the traffic count for the section of the road. I'm sorry, did you? No, go ahead, finish your book. No, please. I... No, no, no. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so the other thing I'd like to know, too, and I know we had talked about this before, and I know other citizens had brought this up as well, the alternative routes that, uh, that there may be and whether or not those other ways of getting around because we went through that pr presentation just a few minutes ago about the uh, the uh, restrictions the 26,000 pound restrictions and the other ways that could be used to, to get to one point to the other uh, in a situation like this again you know having been to 
some of these roads and, and having seen what these roads are like. Uh, you know, I certainly think that it would be well within the scope of information gathering to determine, uh, you know, what the feasibility would be of improving certain roads to, to convey traffic from one point to the other. And I understand that, again, today was specifically about the count of the traffic study, but I agree that I think I want a more in-depth study, uh, in more in-depth traffic study, as well as figuring out, uh, as Commissioner Rothstein said, the impact of that community with these other ways that, that through traffic or even residents who live in that area uh, can can get around. Okay, R Roberta, you. Well, with regard to other ways that you can get around, the pers best person to answer is Chris. <laughs> I'll let you <laughs> speak to that. So I'll answer. Okay. You, you brought yeah. something up about study, and then I'll. Yeah. So a detailed study may will be able to tell us delays. Mm -hmm. You know, say how long you're going to be delayed at Hughes Shop and Pinch Valley. Right. You know, with the additional traffic, and the assumption is going to be made that those 163 cars, a majority of them based on the the normal progression of traffic they're going to head south you know if they were heading north they're going to head south mm -hmm. and they're going to get to Hughes shop there may be some that were going to go out pleasant to pleasant valley um and, and those areas um but we don't know exactly what human nature is going to do where somebody chooses some people choose to take uh, a four mile out of the way because they make a a, a right you know onto a major roadway instead of a left at a, mm -hmm. at a you know a non-signalized intersection or whatever so those are somewhat are, are challenging um here um th yes some are going to use indian valley um and but a majority of them are going to be coming in probably in the other you know coming up the other way um because that's the only side that there is um the traffic study will tell us about traffic volumes and how that's going to function roadway improvements and those that's a whole different study um those are environmental right. widening right. those those are are a whole different uh type mm -hmm. of study and can be costly mm -hmm. so with the the traffic study the, the origin destination that you talked about um and when you, when you say that do you mean you know, from, from where they wake up in the morning to where they end up at the end of the day? Are you talking about from, like, say, this particular point to this particular point? So, yeah, we usually pick an intersection, and when that license plate goes by, did it reach the other point at the other end that we're interested in seeing if they made it? And if they didn't, then we say it's not a through trip. Somewhere in between, they stopped. Okay. So, and I appreciate, I appreciate that dialogue. So I'm trying to put, like I said, and I've, said it before you put everything on the table <clears throat> and then you decide okay what can we do what makes the most sense <clears throat> um recognizing that everything's out there um and then if we can't we pull it back off the table um but uh that's why i'm kind of thinking through this the best i can now roberta you well i think the comment? question the board needs to ask before uh, well, first of all, the traffic studies are in the 50, just the basic traffic study, mm -hmm. which would tell you level of service, which there's not a level of service issue here. This right. isn't, these aren't heavily, so they're all going to be A, the, that our experts already know. Um, and, and then um, turning movements. So that'll be the other information right. that you'd get from a basic traffic um, study. Might be something I'm missing and Chris can fill me in, but those are the two really top things that people are usually looking for out of traffic studies because there's a concern, you know, a big development's going out mm -hmm. in and they're concerned of the impact on 32 and 26, mm -hmm. or right? Thanks. So, <laughs> my area too, so pick on it. Um, but anyway, um, so I think the question the board has to ask is what do they want? If they want a study, though that basic traffic study would cost fifty to sixty thousand dollars, just so you know, right? Those are the right. kinds of quotes we have. Around forty-five, yeah. Forty-five. That's Sorry, the I didn't average, mean to. Average forty-five. I yep. you okay. The other day, um, so so that's the kind of price. But I don't know that that information would really inform the commissioners enough to make any kind of decisions about um, mm -hmm. any kind of changes or improvements or th that that you'd need to make on the rest of the network to improve throughput so i i understand i understand that and um and that's again why i'm, I'm putting it on the table whether we want to go 
in that direction or not. Um, I think it would be a lot more expensive to get the kind of information. There's also, a could be a very much bigger picture, you know, for our government and our staffing and the resources we have, you know, uh, in moving forward with a lot of, you know, these type of decisions, you know, uh, outsourcing, you know, having, you know, 27 Chris's on board would be a whole lot of things, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or at least having two or three. I mean, it's, it's very challenging um, because we are limited in resources. Uh, well, any, you know, any such study would have to be. No, yeah. no, I, I, I agree. I just, but I mean, that's part of this, but Ted, you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to go a little further with where Roberta was heading. I think there's, there's two distinct things on the table here, and I want to make sure it doesn't get muddied. Now, I believe this is true, Eric. If Pinch Valley isn't closed, there is no airport project. Is that right? Okay, so there's no traffic study we're going to do that's going to change that. We're either doing the airport and closing yep. the road, or we're not closing the road and not doing the airport. Okay. So any study is about uh, the, the impact that would go along with that. And right now, I just want to make sure you all know, there, there is no, no budgeting, no planning in place for making any road improvements in connection with, with all this. So um, any money that you would put into a study is, is new money we would have to, to budget. And my argument would be, if you're going to spend the money to do that, it ought to be with an idea that you actually plan to do something. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no point spending it if we're not going to be willing to, right. to do the improvements. Right. So we also need to be thinking that step down the road, too. Uh, are we willing to spend money? How much money are we willing to spend in, in order to make these improvements? You know, if you spend $100,000 on a study and the improvements that it indicates would cost you $5 million, are we willing to do that? Um, and I know we can't answer this perfectly, but if no, not five, are we willing to spend three? Are we willing to spend one? Right. If there's some point where it just it's not going to match up, you know what it would take to do something and what you're willing to do, then there would be no spend no sense spending the money on the studies in the first place. So none of this is to say do it or don't do it. I just want to make sure we're thinking about what steps follow each of, uh, of the early ones. Now I definitely appreciate absolutely appreciate this discussion. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I. Um yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Zaleski. I, I've been I've been listening intently. I I if we were able to get more data, better data, at, in an affordable way, I'd certainly be for it. It sounds like, in my view, it it's not quite affordable. Uh, but in listening, I, 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 I that's what I anticipated this briefing really being about. Pinch Valley Road is going to close. So how do we improve? the lives of the people that live there and the roads around them that that's what I thought this briefing was going to be about and that's what I think we need to be focused on uh, it was it widening lanes is it making f it more easily for easy for people to take a left turn and a right turn I mean that's what we need to be focused on because because my understanding is pinch Valley Road is going to close so let's take a look at some of the roads that have been mentioned and make them as good as we possibly can I think we owe that to the people that live around that on Pinch Valley Road and around it and use it because I mean it's Pinch Valley Road today but tomorrow it's somewhere in our district right so that's what I would right. be saying I'd be having the same conversation and I'd be asking for the same thing which is what I what I was concerned about when this came up in March is that we really hadn't taken a look at that so I appreciate the study and it says that there's I mean I guess you can consider it moderate use I mean people use the road any inconvenience on any county resident should be a concern for the, this board and I think it is but we need to figure out how we're going to make this better when Pinch Valley Road closes, if we can. That's, that's what I think we need to focus on. And that will cost money. But spending it now on a study, I, I guess we found out, is going to be really not necessary and maybe not affordable. So. Yeah, Commissioner Gary, and I, I appreciate it. And that's kind of where I was going as well. And, um, and I, I also appreciate uh, Mr. Zaleski bringing us back down to ground level and that is you know any study we do anything we resource as a study we have to be willing prepared legitimately to do something about it 
And if we're not, then we're doing a study and putting it on the shelf, and that's false hope for a community. So, um, you know, uh, but again, that's why I want to put this all out there. Um, it's, it is difficult because any modifications to any of these roads, would it support the community any better or not? And is it feasible, you know, uh, money-wise, resource-wise, to even to, to, to modify any of these roads? And it doesn't sound like it is. Is that correct? There are a lot of limitations. One yeah. starting with is right away. Mm -hmm. Do we have right away to make the improvements? Okay. Um, then the proximity of you know, do you make it another? Do you make it two lanes? Is it is it twenty feet? Is it fifteen feet? Are there environmental? Um, Eric yeah. talked about some wetlands already. Yeah. I suspect there's there's others. Yeah. Um, it gets very costly very quickly when you start taking an existing road and and widening it or making it, you know, wider. Um, are there spot improvements maybe are you talking about you know an area for a path for people to pass you know some of those already exist um it's to what extent um you... so for me right and if i if i may um i and understand if you want to say anything else feel free or you want nope. to sit i was just hanging around in case the conversation <laughs> got there <laughs> so so for me and and maybe because i you know i am more naive or whatever the case may be for me the intent of doing an additional more in-depth study is not as to whether we a priori decide to take action but to see what the results are to demonstrate whether and where we need to take action to improve roads um, and I certainly understand that there are going to be associated costs and like with Babylon Road right the, the number of unexpected costs that can arise during a project I fully understand that and and, and expect that right um, and I certainly also, you know, not like any of us need to be reminded that we are under serious fiscal constraints. And we have serious financial and budgetary problems moving ahead in the coming fiscal year. Um, but I also understand how difficult a road being closed can be. And if we're talking about, you know, 10 people who are using that road on a daily basis as a, a point of conveyance, as a, a means to convey them as a, as, as a through traffic entity right versus somebody who who necessarily uses that road every day to to get to or from work right i think that the the, the more in-depth study is going to give us a better understanding of of you know what it is that we really are contending with back there um and i, I take the point that that pinch valley has to close that this airport project is happening uh, but I also understand that, that you know, as Commissioner Guerin, I know Commissioner Ralston, you alluded to it as well, that, that, you know, we do have citizens who live back there and that they're not using this road just for a means of conveyance from one place to another. And, um, it, it, you know, it is going to have an impact. And if we are going to be impacting a pretty substantial area back there, as well as the people who do use it for through traffic, then I think that, that having that additional information, yes, will be costly, but it's certainly appropriate to the, the circumstances that, that we are confronted with here. And so, yeah, no, go ahead. Um, a, a couple of things. One, I, I think we ought to take the 50 grand for any more vehicle counts and put it into construction I think it's a waste um, the the big deal is if I'm on the north side of the closure and I come out the south way because I have a low boy a tag along uh, horse trailer and I can't get out the other way we have to make it that they can get out the other way and and Ted I understand what you're saying I said when we talked about closing Pinch Valley if we want to do safety modification of the airport and we want to close Pinch Valley we owe it to the residents to make sure they can safely get out each way and if we didn't plan for that I'm sorry I wasn't here but uh, that that wasn't very smart so whatever we need to make the decisions on on Indian Valley do two turns need to be widened and again nicely put I don't much care if it's wetlands or you need a right away or whatever whoever decided that we were doing a 40-foot fill there and we had to close Pinch Valley Road should have foreseen that we needed to do some road improvements so 
if we didn't have it budgeted we need to and the only reason I see any more dollars spent on counting cars is if you need it to do that design otherwise let's let's do the road closure studies and figure out what we got to do so people can get in and out so i do believe there's cul-de-sacs on each closure point so large vehicles school buses will be able to make that turn so if anybody can't get out one way they come around to the cul-de-sac <clears throat> and they can turn around fire trucks school buses everybody can make the turn in a cul-de-sac so we shouldn't have any any trouble with anybody being able to get out of their property and get to either Pleasant Valley or Indian Valley yeah I, I'm concerned people that 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 uh, I understand the cul-de-sacs but um, if they were going one direction and now they have to go the other direction we need to make sure those roads have the proper turns mm -hmm. because you know you're right yes school buses emergency vehicles everybody can use the cul-de-sac um, but uh, we need to make sure they can use the roads maybe maybe Hugh's shop does need one more turn lane and if it does it does we we need to look at that and that's the study i think the road construction studies are what we need to do the only reason we do any more of this is if you need that uh, as a prerequisite to that study yeah i mean you're looking at 163 vehicles north of indian valley if they were all added that's you know that's 17 trips in an hour in a, in a peak hour that's maybe one or two vehicles you know or you know it, even at the cycle length of of huge shop in 140 um it's not a lot yep. not a lot of trips mm -hmm. in in the, in what we see overall in the, in the network it, it is an impact it's just it may be hard to quantify that small number mm -hmm in that larger intersection movement and the and yep. the signal to figure out that the that those 163 vehicles you know need we need to add 30 more feet to the turn lane or something like that it may be difficult for to, to quantify that so basically there's two decisions one is moving forward and closing Pinch valley road and the second that's already decided. we've decided yeah, so that's that. that's so so really the second decision is <clears throat> whether you want any further study any further to study for modification of this road network correct is that where we're at right now i mean yeah. is it, okay I mean, is that something that 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 we have people in-house to do or is that a consultant it's a consultant those are consultants yeah. That's what I brian you had something to say yeah, I just want to close one more loop that was mentioned this morning by Ms. Pataglia, um, and, and, and I believe it was mentioned in May as well that, you know, this is a project that's related to the airport. Um, the feds are paying a lot of money for the airport improvement project. We all know that. Um, we don't have a clear defined answer if they will fund any of this work. Um, you know, the, the federal government may say, you know, the, the closure of Pitch Valley Road does not warrant any other additional funding for, for this area. So, you know, just again, being mindful, we don't know the answer to that. We have a good feeling, um, but, you know, to back to Ted's point, you know, this is, you know, a project that was not budgeted and most likely will not be funded by the federal government or, or state government any of these road improvements but we have made a formal request back to them correct we have not because we there's no not. dollars associated with the work yet okay there'd have to be a plan i would guess it would have right? to be oh, something yeah. mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. thank you so okay. the thought is rather no. than a traffic study to look at a road improvement study no. for one second sir Oh, I'm sorry. So the, the the thought then is is rather than as Commissioner Tyler has said, not a traffic study, but a road improvement study, specifically what, for Indian Valley. Whatever, yeah, whatever has to be done next for. Mm -hmm. Sir, unfortunately, by design, we have open comments for a few minutes, and then comes back to us. So not to go back and forth. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Lenach. And real quick question: I'm looking here at this list. What is the traffic count for Indian Valley I'm trying to find this on this very tiny sheet and I'm not seeing. sorry it. it's uh 86 which would be north of Pinch Valley and then 28 and 53 south of uh, Pleasant Valley okay thank you so I don't know what the next step is but for me it's pretty simple if we the county do this right and we as the five of us we're the ones that you know take the heat and and, and else what uh, what else but if we do this right and we make improvements to the roads around pinch valley i'm going out of limb here 
But the people that live on Pinch Valley may actually come to appreciate what's been done because now they're living on a cul-de-sac. They don't have people driving by. And now when they need to get someplace, there's been minimal delay. So that's going to be our gauge, whether we do this right or not. And it sounds like, and I don't know what we need next. We need a motion. We need you to come back as we need to make sure that we are improving the roads around Pinch Valley. So maybe our wish of these folks even being happier than they are now, perhaps, possibly, could come true. So, so the first step would be to figure out what construction needs or would warrant it to be done. Is that, and that goes back to what you were saying. Mm. Yeah. Correct, uh, uh, Doug? Yeah, so, uh, and that's exactly where I was gonna get. So to what Commissioner Kyler said, well, it, it would provide us some direction, and that's what your, your statement said, is that if the, when the road closes, you just want to make sure that whether they're exiting out this side or that side, that their exit is seamless. So if you want to look at those exit points, right? So if you have X amount of cars that are leaving from there and seeing what's going on, do you need to make any improvements on this side of Pinch Valley, or do you need to make any improvements on that side of Pinch Valley to get cars in and out of Pinch Valley, that's the sort of clear direction then staff can hone in on to say here is what we need to do. Maybe it is a turn lane. Maybe we need to put down a, a little bit wider road, ways to make that area safer. But that's the that's the sort of thing that will also allow us, um, you know, whether it's in-house or out-of-house to define that. Yes, and, and a budget number. Right, you know, and, or, give it, or, and or, sharpen it down. Or there's a turn on Indian Valley that I can't go around with a low boy. Right. But it's wetlands on both sides, and so we can't do anything. And but but that's that's the answers and and a budget number. I sure. think. Now, does that, Commissioner Garen, make sense? I mean, that's kind of where I, you I were going that, as well. Yeah, I, I think yeah. yeah, I think we're all starting to move in that same direction. Okay. okay. Um, and you said you and I wouldn't agree today. Yeah, well, there. You go. I did say <laughs> that no, actually. Look, look. <laughs> what, what I'd like to do is. Uh, <laughs> I know it's scary to go off script a, a little <laughs> bit, but, um, you know, and Ned and Terry, you want to make further public comment. Uh, if I allow you to come on up just for a minute, make whatever public comment you want, but it is not interaction. So, but if you feel free. Ladies first. Thank you. I just want to ask you also to be mindful. Back in July when 140 was closed down due to the gas leak, I will tell you, Pinch Valley, Indian Valley Trail, um, those roads were cluster because people coming down 97, coming 97 south, they turn on the Pleasant Valley Road, turn on Pinch Valley, turn on Indian Valley, just to get to the other side of 140. So, you know, when, when you're talking about like Indian Valley Trail, and you, you, you know, it's a done deal, you're closing Pinch Valley. That I need you guys to keep in mind too. You know, it's, it's, it's a very tiny road. If any of you guys have been on Indian Valley Trail, it is small. You can't pass another vehicle on that road at all. So, you know, if, if this is what's gonna happen, I think that's what the focus needs to be is, is looking at widening any Valley Trail, you know, making it more accessible, you know, for anybody that, you know, lives in that area to get from point A to point B and, and, and back. But okay. I just want you guys to understand that like, it was the Autobahn, it was ridiculous. So. Got it, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ned. I'll ditto that and I, I'll just say, I think Commissioner Kyler's on the right track. The traffic study, a detailed traffic study would, would be invaluable but you don't have the money. The feds aren't gonna include this in, I just heard that. So they should have done that, but they, did, they don't. This is the problem, money, okay? Absolutely. What's gonna happen if you do nothing? You will fill that area down there and you will deflect all the traffic that does come through onto Indian Valley Trail. So you can sit back and do nothing and wait until they're head-on collisions on those over verticals or cars and people coming in to the then county commissioners complaining about it. So but you've got time because I think the fill isn't going to go in until when? Five years from now? Something like that? Three to five. Three to five years. How many? Three to five years. 
We said three to five. Three to five. So I think the focus should be finding some money to get out, start putting money aside to rehab Pinch Valley Trail, to make it, to go to the worst spots first, the over verticals, and then work the widening. Uh, otherwise, it, it's going to be a mess. Okay. Because it will be open. You will not close Indian Valley Trail, and people will keep going because they have, the ones that are heading up to Gettysburg, coming out of our area. So it's just a matter of, okay, find the money to do what you have to do to Indian Valley Trail. I appreciate and, it. And uh, that's, that's it. No, nope, I, I got in. I think, uh, and I do appreciate it, uh, part of the conversation we had with, you know, again, Mr. Bokey was, what's the project? Where, where are we asking for funding? Where are we looking so? And I think each one of our districts, we have our own Indian Valley Trail in our districts. Mine may be Marysville too, you know, which becomes a nightmare to a lot. Um, I got a couple in mind. So you have a couple in yours. So, okay. I appreciate it. What we need to do now is any direction or have we already so provided like the, the direction? Just, just to clarify, I think Doug did a good job, but just the board, it sounds pretty unanimous in the idea of looking at at least an in-house analysis of the, the in, at least Indian Valley to make sure that, um, some certain trucks can get around and and um, if not what maybe we could do to um, improve those areas and what and a, a, at least a an approximate cost yeah is that clear enough guidance for you Chris Are you talking in-house or consultant in-house well let's at least evaluate whether we think we could do something in-house and uh, if yeah. not then we can come back with yeah. a, a, yeah, have a to look price out. for a consultant right. yeah. and then the board can decide where yeah. they go from there and, and that's fair I mean you know uh, <clears throat> resource time people and money if we don't have the people and the time then we got to figure out if, if they're where the money may come from yeah. to do this but that's on you to staff to come back to us to say this is what the requirement is yeah. or actually you know what the requirement is we just gave it to you but here's the solution to that requirement so. move forward. okay is that good enough for all of us yes sir yes good deal okay that's your guidance thank you thank you, thank very you. Much. Thank you. And thank great you, discussion uh, too all that came into talk. Now let's let's talk about something easier. Request approval to purchase land for the airport runway safety improvement program. Mr. Bokey's leaving you alone on this one. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> just, just you know. <laughs> yes, Commissioner. So this, this, uh, this would be the the purchase of the the land that we were uh, discussing just previously to, uh, to put one of the cul-de-sacs on. I won't, I won't read you the, the exact numbers um, from the briefing paper, but it's, it's basically we're buying some, some portion of land in Fee Simple, some for drainage easement, some for grading easement, and some for abrogation easement, um, all for a total of 105497 And that is two parcels, parcel 10 and parcel 59. And again, this is in con this is in connection with the runway safety enhancement project. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, ninety percent of this would be paid by. Oh yes, yeah. sorry, no, ninety percent would be covered by the FAA. Uh, five percent state, five percent Carroll County. So five percent, we're talking five thousand, seven thousand out of this, or what? What, what are you saying? Yeah, five percent of one hundred and five. Okay, somebody. Ted, do you want to share something before we um, motion? This isn't really specifically about this decision, but just I'm not sure with this board we, we've talked about this big picture idea to keep in mind here. With this project, um, we are heavily dependent on FAA funding, but it comes on their schedule, not on our schedule. So there's a lot that has to happen in terms of us identifying what are eligible costs to be reimbursed, making sure that we're keeping track of those as they're happening, even though they're not always gonna be reimbursed and for us what's a, a timely way. And we're making some significant expenditures at the beginning that we know won't be reimbursed for, for years. Uh, so it's very important that we 
stay on top of how all this is working out and, and remember kind of what's going on. And um, another piece of this is the timing is so off, uh, it's likely at some point we will be going for some short-term uh, uh, loans to, as a cash flow bridge mm -hmm. for us. So um, I don't know when that'll be happening, but at some point you'll probably be hearing something like that. So I just thought it was good to have all that in mind. So as other pieces come up, you know, you're thinking about it in terms of the, the whole thing. I, I appreciate it. Unfortunately, we have Mr. Burdine, and we're blessed to have him to stay on top of it, as he does very diligently. Um, so I do appreciate it. Uh, how soon does how soon does this happen? The the purchase uh, settlement will be will be scheduled uh, not 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 far from today if you, if you all vote to mm -hmm. so soon. Yeah. 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 We would, okay. we would then we would then schedule schedule a settlement with with the homeowner. Okay. Okay. Motion to approve the purchase of land and easements at fourteen seventy Pinch Valley Road for one hundred five thousand four hundred ninety seven dollars. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Any discussion? Seen here. None. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank okay. You. Let's talk about uh, Westminster area sidewalk improvements. <clears throat> Chris, you're like uh, you <laughs> know, a last. scene today. I you know. know. It's Public Works Day. Wow. Hey, Carrie, take care of Chris. What do we got? I'll try. Good morning. Good morning. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Engineering, requests your approval to award the contract for the Westminster Area Sidewalk Improvements to Pessoa Construction Company in the amount of $237,144. The county requested competitive sealed bids and received five responses, with one being disqualified. Pessoa Construction submitted the lowest, most responsive and responsible bid that met the criteria listed in the solicitation. The amount is within the adopted budget. So as part of the county's effort to upgrade our existing ADA ramps uh, to current standards, we're going to make improvements to 27 different locations in the Westminster area with this project. It will include the ramp work, landing areas, and any of the adjacent curbs. Project is expected to take about 50 days. Uh, we are familiar with this contract as some of our staff uh, has worked with them in the past, and uh, I know they're anxious to get started. Uh, they're asking us this morning uh, when this contract's coming. Okay. Sounds great. <clears throat> Any questions? If not, is there a motion? I move the <coughs> Board of Commissioners award the contract Westminster Area Sidewalk Improvements to Pessoa Contract uh, Construction Company in the amount of $237,144. Second. I got a mo One quick question. So, so this is more upgrading to meet standards than repair this or is additions? Just, this this is, is just ADA ramps. ADA. There will be a couple additional ramps in order we have some diagonal crossings and because the law requires you to have the shortest crossing they'll make them 90 degree crossings so so the additional ones are again because just, of changes just around, yeah they're just yep. around okay yes. thanks yeah the ada we thought we were we were good when they were installed and it changes yeah of course not. Okay. sounds good and and all these improvements are looks like they're within district three but none of them are within the town of of westminster no they're all just in to clarify yes that's okay. correct thank you Good point. Thank you. Yes, we're being really nice. Today. Yes, we don't <laughs> want to be that nice. <laughs> we have a lot of hours to do ourselves, so exactly. once those get done, we can talk about that. Exactly. There's no further comment necessary on that one. <clears throat> um, any further discussion on that? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, yes. carrier one for one. Let's talk about the Union Mills Homestead Grist Mill mill wheel and shaft replacement. <coughs> Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Commissioners, we're here today to request your approval of a contract for the construction services of the Union Mills Homestead Grist Mill, mill Wheel and Shaft Replacement in the amount of $280,000 to B.E. Hassett Mill Rights Incorporated. 
As you are aware, the Union Mills Homestead hosts tours for the property, I'm sorry, yes, of the property for schools, private groups, individual tours, social and historical events, as well as special celebrations. The active mill located at Union Mills Homestead produces grain products as part of the living history experience. The existing mill wheel, mill wheel gear and shaft have reached the end of its useful life and will need to be removed and replaced. The county solicited a detailed request for proposals for this very specialized service and received only one from BE Hassett Mill Rights Incorporated, which is located in Harrods Creek, Kentucky. BE Hassett Mill Rights Incorporated has an extensive background in this type of workmanship and has previously provided similar work for the removal and replacement of the mill flume at Union Mills in 2021. The county was very pleased with the work they provided. The amount we are requesting is within the adopted budget. If you don't have any questions for me, I'll turn it over to Dean, who actually worked on the mill flume project back in 2021 with this um, particular uh, vendor. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, we were very happy with the work that uh, the contractor <clears throat> did, and uh, we hope to uh, move along and, and have him do the additional work. What is the general lifespan of a <laughs> mill wheel and shaft? It depends if it's covered. If it has a roof over it, it'll last a lot longer. But uh, we've been getting like 20, 20 to 25 years out of the, the, the wheel. And that's why the flume was replaced last year, because they were both replaced at the same time. Motion to award the contract for construction services for the Union Mills Homestead Grist Mill Mill Wheel and Shaft Replacement to BE Hassett Mill Rights Incorporated in the amount of $280,000. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. What do we do with the old mill wheel? I mean, is there value to it? Certain pieces of it, yeah. the, the wheel and the shaft, we're going to leave out there so people can actually touch it, have it laying out there in the yeah. grass yeah. so they can actually walk up and touch it. That keeps them away from going up to where the uh -huh. wheel actually is. Yeah. But we're going to use part of it. The rest of it uh, will probably be just gotten rid of. Yeah. That's a good. Uh, that's a good idea to have a static display so folks can see what a mill wheel is and actually physically mm -hmm. touch right. it. You know? Okay. Yeah. My 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 reluctance on this one has is no way reflects upon the work the staff has done to research this issue and find somebody who can do the right work. It just seems like an awful lot of money to me. So I am uh, I am opposed until we can maybe discuss that cost some more, but that's just me. So, Commissioner, you're talking about what, putting it back out for bid, or? Perhaps it's unfair for me to apply this sort of ideology to just about everything that we do, but I do, and I think a lot of us, we're all, we're all principled up here. $280,000 is a lot of money to replace a mill when we've got the challenges we do in the county. It's, it's just a hard pill to swallow. And I recognize the fact that the people that operate Union Mills love the place. It's rich in history. It's an important landmark in Carroll County. But uh, it's just an awful lot of money. <laughs> so I'm having a difficult time with this one. Is uh, the is the mill wheel uh, lifespan, I mean, is, is it... Is it done? I mean, there's no function left within this mill wheel? It's, it's actually falling apart. We've been out there, we've been running cables in it yeah. and, and, and doing a lot of work to it to keep it running. Yeah. And it actually is to the point now, every now and then it, it, it gets stuck because it's, it's sinking, it's, it's, it's done. It's, if you keep running it, it's just gonna fall so, completely So you apart. basically put enough Band-Aids on it to get it to where it is now. So it's either yes. keep it static only or Replace. replace it yeah and even static it's just it's gonna sure. fall apart yeah how old is the current wheel okay mm, it's around 25 years okay. i think maybe more okay well and, and the state <coughs> excuse me the statement that this is within budget it's mm -hmm. planned for it was in the budget it's all county taxpayer money this isn't because they do sometimes get grants out there f to do some work but this isn't the case this time. No, this was county money. Correct. 
And I think Commissioner Guerin has a, a valid point when we're looking at any dollars we're spending up here, be it trucks, be it a, a, a mill wheel, be it whatever it is. I think we're all very cognizant and aware of that. Um, I do think, while I agree with that point, I do think one of the challenges, obviously, is we only had one uh, entity that was, you know, willing to put forth you know an option on this and then it's a specialized field we're not going to just go out and be able to hire somebody on an easy basis to do something like this so i i do recognize your point and and i i, I agree with you in the fact that it is significant money i think the challenge is, is if to mr leister's point if we do nothing we've already kind of extended this piece as far as we can be it stagnant or for usage yeah, I mean, probably stretched it as long as we can. Yeah, we have. I mean, this uh, this company uh, B Hassett Millwrights. I mean, they have a a niche in the market, and you know they take advantage of that. And I, I, I would I would say, Commissioner, that that firm that did the flume work, mm -hmm. um, as a result of their quality, their workmanship, and materials, Maryland Historical Trust actually gave them gave an award for that flume project so our confidence and trust in in that vendor is, is very strong can it give them a two hundred and eighty thousand dollar reward and apply it to this <laughs> okay okay i think we've had a good discussion i appreciate the insight that you all are providing um on this i had a motion, motion and, and a so. second any further discussion on this seeing here none all in favor aye, aye. against no. Okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Commissioners. You. Appreciate thank your you. time. Okay, let's talk about repairing a vehicle, uh, a wheel loader, a 544K wheel loader. Gentlemen. Morning. 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 Oh, right. That was like in harmony. Go ahead. <laughs> we practiced. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management and Warehouse Operation, requests your approval for the repairs of a John Deere, John Deere wheel loader in the amount of $69,911.38 to Resurrection Auto Body, to whom is a term contractor with Carroll County Government. This amount is within the fiscal year 24 approved budget and additional funds should be necessary. Yep. As we're all aware, rust is a major enemy for the DPW vehicles and equipment. The loaders are no exception. Um, here are a couple pictures of the outside of the cab. Uh, it looks pretty excessive, but believe it or not, this portion is repairable. What's not repairable is the rust that has accumulated underneath the cab. Uh, the metal has rusted from the inside out. Um, and we do believe that, so, so what we are requesting today is actually replacement of the cab in its entirety. Uh, that includes the, the inside components and some hydraulic components. Uh, and we do believe this will extend the life of the unit by at least five years. Okay. I mean, the way you described it, I feel like it's like the Flintstones car with uh, Fred and Barney <laughs> trying to use their feet. <laughs> Just but, about. Okay. Um, and and the, what, uh, go ahead. What is the cost of this, like the whole thing, if you were to buy it new? Uh, right now, it's about $230,000. So the what is it, sixty nine thousand nine hundred eleven thirty eight is going to be a significant cost savings to us if we extend the life of this. Correct, and and we did consider um, uh, replacing the unit, but because it only has thirty four hundred hours, we do we do expect much more life out of it. So the uh, the repairs or the cab replacement is a more cost effective method to keep the unit in function. Okay. Cool. Okay. Any yeah, discussion? Is there any way we can use uh, a used mill wheel to help power this somehow? <laughs> and I could Put on the floorboards. Sounds like no. <laughs> okay. Motion to approve the purchase for repair work to vehicle number 8152544K wheel loader incorporated in the amount of $69,911.38. Second. Got a motion, guys. Second. Any discussion on this? Seen here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about household hazardous waste events. MXI Environmental Services. All right. Good, Ryan. Uh, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Solid Waste 
Request the Board of Commissioners approval of a fiscal year 24 household hazardous waste event agreement with the Northeast, Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority. Work includes conducting two household hazardous waste collection events annually through MXI Environmental of Abington, Virginia in the amount of $44,000. The funds are included in the approved fiscal year uh, 24 SWEF operating budget. Um, no additional funding will be necessary unless material volume of household hazardous waste delivered by county residents exceeds forecasted uh, quantities. All right, good morning, commissioners. Morning. Uh, back in February of uh, this year, the Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority issued a invitation for bids uh, for qualified contractors uh, to perform household hazardous waste events for both Carroll and Frederick County. And as we've discussed in the past, this is again the ability to be able to use some buying power uh, by multiple counties going in on a bid. Uh, basically, what the bid covered was performing household hazardous waste or HHW events. Uh, Frederick and Carroll County up to four per year uh, for each county just in case we decide we could do more ultimately one proposal uh, one qualifying proposal was received and that was from MXI Environmental Services of Abington Virginia uh, MXI is very experienced they conduct HHW events uh, for both public and private entities throughout the eastern US uh, and based on review of their qualifications and pricing the Authority Board uh, executed a contract with MXI. Uh, that contract uh, term runs through June 30th of 2026 with two potential one-year extensions uh, at the sole discretion of the counties. Uh, the HHW event services are approved in the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget, uh, as was mentioned. And again, no additional funding would be necessary unless we get outrageous participation, uh, which is always possible. Uh, and uh, again, the quantities are delivered beyond that. Okay, cool. Motion to approve executing a contract with Northeast Maryland Waste Disposal Authority for the use of MXI Environmental Services LLC to conduct two household hazardous waste drop off events annually under conditions of the authority executed contract in the amount of $44,000. Second. I got a motion all done in one breath and a second. <laughs> Any discussion on this? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much. Commissioner Guerin, in the private sector, we did use heavy weights dropped from a crane to improve compaction at the landfill. Maybe we could do that with the wheel. See, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Where are you going with this? We can look into it. Right, thank, thank you, Mr. Angle. Appreciate it. Have a good okay. day. Okay. Chief, why don't you come on up and let's talk about the approval to purchase two LifePak 15V4 monitor defibrillators. All right. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Fire and EMF, EMS requests your approval to award the purchase of two LifePak 15 V4 monitor defibrillators from Stryker Medical in the amount of $60,941.80. This purchase will be made through a Maryland state contract that was competitively bid. This amount is within the fiscal year 24 adopted budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Yes, and this, this is just uh, giving us permission to make the procurement um, based on a previously approved grant. Mm -hmm. And then once we get the equipment, uh, we'll be reimbursing, or we'll be reimbursed by the state. So um, roughly uh, $30,587 will be coming back to the county. So the net cost will be much less than the 60000 Well, maybe we can apply it to a... Uh wheeled or something <laughs> just saying okay motion to award the purchase of life pack 15 v4 monitor defibrillators from striker medical in the amount of sixty thousand nine hundred forty one dollars and eighty cents second i have a motion second any discussion on this seen here none all in favor aye, aye. aye. thank you ryan thank thanks you. chief thank you gentlemen okay wanda why don't you come on up here um for uh open admin do you want to do what open admin yeah that discussion first yeah or? So that's right. Why don't you just come on up for a sec? And um, so, open admin. Um, the one thing I want to bring up, uh, and I think we all are in concurrence of this, and we've received information, a lot of uh, information in the news regarding the legislation that's out there uh, with juvenile, um, and there's a couple of different. Interrogation Protection Act and yeah, do you have, I mean there, there's a couple of them that are out there and uh, we were asked 
um, for public comment, um, we, I won't say deferred, but well, we did uh, to our sheriff and state's attorney's office who has that responsibility and authority to do the things that are necessary. We uh, collectively agreed with what they shared and uh, one to let them answer those tough questions, but also are very uh, supportive of the work that they both do in their offices. Um, and uh, I think it would be a good measure to add on to that and reach out to our legislation and even our governor saying that a special session should be is warranted in doing this um, and also uh, to address these issues but understanding the overall importance of this it's not the session that matters most it's the issues that matter right. the most so regardless of a special session is addressed or, or adhered to and, and conducted which I doubt it would be um, that these topics and extreme these major concerns are addressed as the highest priority um, in our legislators and our General Assembly um, as soon as they convene uh, that's kind of my opening salvo and, and you know that's where I was going to go with this but if there's any thoughts and comments and, and basically what I want to do is direct staff into packaging this together um, and getting all of us to yeah. sign it um, but you want to go down? yeah I appreciate you broaching the subject and 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 taking this action requesting a special legislative session to review the state of crime in the state in particular those two laws that were passed by the General Assembly uh, we're asking them to take a larger look at that when they return to session but we're it's important to know and I think Commissioner Rothstein alluded to this we are certainly not alone in our thoughts on this in fact one of the biggest proponents of a change of a special session is some by the name of Ivan Bates he is the Baltimore City attorney mm -hmm. and I, I tell you, I've really come to admire this this gentleman uh, look at he's he's on the news all the time so we are just echoing what every single city and county attorney to my to my knowledge has has agreed to that mm -hmm. this they, we have some serious issues here and they've got to review those laws I wish there was more leadership to call a special session I don't think there is so that leaves as Commissioner Rossi mentioned this these things to be fixed hopefully in the General Assembly when the regular session begins so, thank you. absolutely I'm I'm sorry please I was just gonna make one quick comment you you sort of covered most of it there Commissioner Garen um I think it's definitely warranted in what we're contending with and I think you know when we're looking at what law enforcement and our legal system is faced and now challenged with it is um, of the utmost importance that this this topic be uh, reviewed and looked at again and we may or may not see a special session but I think the the underlying concern is that we we would like to see this because it is of that level of significance and importance okay. I couldn't agree more and I, and I think it it ties into uh, Commissioner Gary your some of your comments about parents and kids mm -hmm. um, this whole mindset that you're not really guilty of doing something wrong when you're guilty of doing something wrong does not help anybody and and yeah we have to push yep I'm I'm totally in agreement with everything that's been said so far and I think that you know at the root of it too is that that you know when, when you are talking about crime whether it's a theft or a murder or a gang shooting uh, whatever it is it's no way any less a crime because of the age of the person who's committing the crime you know the victim does not suffer any less because the culprit is a minor and and so I think that uh, you know as has been hinted at I mean we may not get anywhere with getting a special session out of this um, but at least lending our voices to the discussion on behalf of the citizens that we serve is, is integral to what we do and also to the nature of the issue at hand and so I'm, I commend all of my fellow commissioners for being willing to, to pursue this so and I'm, I'm, with you. Uh, I'm just uh, tired and exhausted of so much of this doesn't deter me from moving forward <laughs> um, you know and uh, this is not a partisan concern as Commissioner Darren alluded to right. I mean every leader that have, I've come across in our jurisdictions have come said the exact same thing we have the conference I'm so proud of our uh, 
relationships with our state's yes. attorney and yes. our sheriff's department as they say the exact same thing just as our uh, relationship with our legislators and board of education we are doing very well in that moving forward um so yeah what uh we'll do and uh roberta you take the lead on this um package together uh the appropriate verbiage um and get it back to us for signature and we'll move forward okay is there anything else for open admin okay wanda let's hello wanda hello <laughs> wow uh-oh columbus day observance oh my gosh monday november 9th columbus day observance this world this is moving fast um tuesday and wednesday and thursday i will be attending a baltimore maryland council no baltimore metro, metro council Politics. i'll get that straight one of these days uh what's called chesapeake connect uh, we're going to minneapolis um at least you know where you're going yeah i know where i'm going <laughs> i'll have my cane with me and then at 7 p.m uh we're unsupervised again next thursday <laughs> you got tim <laughs> he did say supervised. Yeah, Tim. <laughs> I just want to see his fa face turn red at red or red. What happened when you were supervised today? So, yeah. That's true. That's true. I know. Okay, and then uh, we have the Farm Bureau annual banquet meeting over at Pleasant Valley Firemen's Building. Uh, Commissioner Gordon Kyler and Vigliotti will be attending that evening. On Wednesday, October 11th, the Farm Museum board meeting. Commissioner Vigliotti will be attending that morning, and then. There'll be a joint Board of Education and Board of County Commissioners joint meeting. I, it's an away game. It's over at the uh, uh, CCPS uh, boardroom. And currently scheduled is Commissioner Gordon, Garen, Kyler, and Vic Liotti. I will not be participating in that. Uh, Habitat for Humanity, Hammer, and Ales. Pub Dog Brewing Company. Hopefully you're doing the hammer before you're doing the ales. Mm -hmm. Commissioner <laughs> Kyler will be attending that. Um, and then there's a Board of Education meeting that evening at 5 p.m. If anyone would like to take that on, just uh, I think let Wanda know. I know that I will not be able to, to do that that evening. I'm not around, so, so somebody would like to. Um, there's a Chamber of Commerce annual meeting with Anaban Basu uh, over Morin's of Westminster. Really? I thought Morin's closed. I understand they're supposed to, but not yet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, currently, Commissioner Gordon and Kyler are It'll attending. It'll be a really short meeting if it is closed. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Gordon and Kyler attending. If the others have not attended before, Anaban Basu is a... Um, an entertainer along with economist rolled up in one and uh, you know usually has good attendance uh, at this event that uh, morning after that um, we starting the open session a little bit later because of that Chamber of Commerce meeting in open what do we have okay um, a grant approval to apply for the annual year 24 courthouse security items funding announcement and accept the award and judge hecker will be uh attending um another it'll be a public hearing and grant approval to submit application and acceptance of the cdbg or the community development block grant Recovery Support Housing Round 2 uh, regarding the Westminster Rescue Mission. Transfer of funds regarding the capital, uh, capital transfer of funds for the Farm Museum. And then we will use those funds if they are adequately transferred for Carroll County Farm Museum Maintenance Building Interior filled out. On Friday, October 13th, there's a open house at the Tracy building, which is the expansion of Ridge Engineering. And then Saturday, and Commissioner Kyler and Vigliotti are attending that. On Saturday, October 14th, there's a walk in the park over at Leicester Park. Commissioner Kyler will be attending. 
and I have the podcast uh, that following day. On uh, October 16th, there's a Carroll Community College Foundation Scholarship Luncheon. Uh, Commissioner Gordon and Kyler will be attending. Um, okay, then there's a Greater Baltimore Committee Connecting Transportation Economic Summit. Ugh, I'll be attending that. That was an ur of happiness. I was going to say, you sound thrilled about that. That was an ur of happiness. Um, then Commissioner Guerin has a Chamber of Commerce breakfast uh, over at the Mount Airy Senior Center, uh, Tuesday morning, 8 a.m. There's a Planning and Zoning uh, Commission meeting at 9 a.m. Commissioner Gordon will be attending. Commissioner Gordon and Kyler will be attending the Veterans Advisory meeting <clears throat> at 2 p.m. that afternoon. And then there's an the Ag Center board meeting at 7 p.m. I'll be participating in. On Wednesday, there is a MACO, Maryland Association of Counties, Interim Legislative Committee meeting, which will be virtual. Commissioner Kyler and I will be participating in. The Carroll Community College Board of Trustees meeting, um, Commissioner Kyler and Vigliotti will be attending. I think I'm just attending that, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, the Emergency Services Advisory Council ESAC meeting. Commissioner Garron will be attending that. On Thursday, it is the Carroll County Department of Social Services open house in Westminster. Is anybody attending this or? So far, no, it looks like. Okay. Um, I'll check my schedule. And you see on October 19th, there is no open session. Uh, on Friday, October 20th, nothing scheduled. Saturday, October 21st is the Fort Meade Alliance Foundation Stars and uh, Service Gala. I'll be attending that at 7 p.m. Um, and then also at 7 p.m., the 149th Maryland State Grange Awards Banquet. Don't know if anybody's attending that or not. Um, Commissioner Vigliotti has the podcast the next day. And then the 240th Anniversary Stone Chapel United Methodist Church. Commissioner Gordon and Kyler will be participating or attending at 2 p.m. Ms. Hill, could you add me to that, please? I was just going to say, could you add me to that as well, please? Thank That's, you. Um, okay um we need to add the um credit rating trip yeah Wednesday, that, uh, Thursday, friday that would be right yeah there's a credit rating on um wednesday thursday friday yep 18 through f and commissioners which is why i'm not what right. why he's subbing for Tyler me and, the and trustees Rossi, okay. i'll try to grow so, a big mustache yeah. by then and so uh that way sure kyler and i will be attending the credit rating in new york city those three days um I need a, was that everything? Yeah. I need a motion to uh, recess and go into closed. So moved. Or land acquisition. For land acquisition. So, so moved. Go into closed for land acquisition. Motion go into closed for land acquisition. So moved. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Then do I see a motion to adjourn after that? Yes. Motion to adjourn after that. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.